Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to a post on what my family has been doing during our sta coronavirus staycation. <laughs> like many people, we are stuck at home, and I've spent that time making some fabulous coronavirus face masks. This one is rather satiny, sparkly, and it has a coronavirus theme with this sort of beading here. I wore this to the grocery store yesterday and felt quite fabulous. Um, another coronavirus project is drawing a geometric representation of the spread of the virus. So this is patient zero, and of course, it, not, we're not done with these drawings. I have a bunch of them in different color schemes. Another coronavirus-themed project might be to make a doily. Doilies are actually quite lovely representations of the shape of the coronavirus, and you might make one to commemorate this time. If you prefer something a little less complicated, you might choose knitting. Or if you have small children, they might enjoy weaving something. Basic repairs of household items are also a good thing to do during a staycation. And we have a broken um, chain of lights that was decorating my daughter's room that I'd like to repair, but we're being held back by this little device here. How stupid is that? It's a multimeter. The batteries are dead, and nobody <laughs> in our family can figure out how to open this thing in order to get it to change the batteries. I mean, we've looked up the part name. It's a Duny 07976. And I mean, there are two physicists in this house and a bunch of curious kids, and we cannot open this thing. We've tried screwdrivers, knives, and removing the sticker from the back. Whoever designed this was an evil genius. <laughs> but that's enough about our projects. Um, I could say a little bit about how things in Germany are, because it might be a little bit different from where you are. Um, when the, f the crisis started, was getting underway, and we were told to stay home, we, of course, like everybody else, went out and did some shopping, got maybe a couple of weeks worth of food to put in our basement and the flour people bought all of the the wheat flour and that's still gone because I don't think they trust all of us not to hoard it and possibly waste it because if you don't use flour it can get wasted and maybe it makes sense to trust the bakeries more they know how to deal with flour more than regular people like us. Uh, the toilet paper is still, the supply is being a bit restricted. <laughs> That's okay, we're fine with that. And um, there's more security in the grocery stores and some of the higher end grocery stores only let a few people in at a time. So on a Saturday morning, you might see a long line outside of the grocery store of the wealthy grocery stores, not the regular ones. They just let everybody in. But for those who want a more secluded shopping experience, you can find that. Um, well, what else? We planted some flowers, some dahlias, and gladiolas, and crocosamia, and 
bean seeds and pumpkin seeds. So I'm really looking forward to seeing all of that grow. But we still have a month to go, and the kids aren't that enthusiastic about doing all of their schoolwork. They feel like, I'll do it all in one day and then just be free. And then it's really hard for me to keep them busy on sensible activities. But we are prioritizing a relaxed environment over a strict militaristic environment at the moment. Maybe they'll get sick of that and want more management in the future. I don't know. For those of you who like data analysis, I, of course, like all of you, have spent some time staring at the coronavirus numbers on websites like the CDC and World Worldometer, and I've been I wonder what they mean. And because I have experience analyzing data, I do my own analysis and compare it to what the media says. And I'm confused by how the U.S. tends to report a 3% death rate, some places even say 4.5%. And then the German virologists on the new evening news will say things like, it may only be 0.5% to 1%. So... I mean, there's all kinds of conflicting information about that. And there are even, there's a Nature article about how different people may have different genetic profiles that give them more receptors in their lungs that make coronavirus worse or better. I mean, the, that kind of speculation even makes it into our top journals like Nature. And so there, there's no single authority that you can really turn to. So I turn to myself and just trust that because um, what I see is that you have to identify the best data sets available and compare those and see if they agree. For example, um, the Diamond Princess Cruise gives you a data set for a group of young workers and older, um, the guests on the boat were older, the people who worked on the boat were younger, and they were all quite healthy people and they had a 3% death rate. And a larger population would have children and older, sicker people. So... You look for a population like South Korea or like the people in Germany who have been tested for coronavirus extensively as the epidemic was tracked very um, carefully as it spread through the population. And I think those two countries have numbers that are in rough agreement as far as a death rate calculated with recoveries and those who died. I don't think it makes sense sense to calculate a death rate with the number of people infected and those who died because there are so many newly infected people that you don't know how their cases are going to go so you can't use that number if you use the number of recovered too early in an epidemic then you're also going to overestimate a death rate so you want to look for an epidemic that's sort of underway and in the middle and look at their recovery versus death rate and see what that looks like. And there I think I see something like maybe 4.5% compared to Wuhan's 7.5%. And I don't understand the numbers that China's been giving outside of Wuhan where they seem to be saying that the epidemic is completely over in their population of 1.7 billion, was it? So that's amazing. Um, so there are so many interesting things to track, and I do puzzle over those numbers and what they mean for the future um, because different countries have more old people and some countries have very few old people. For example, in Africa... 40% um, of the population is under the age of 15. 
And in the U.S., 40% of the population is over the age of, was it 50 or 60? I think 50. I don't know. Worldwide, 25% of the population is over the age of 50. And if you see that this disease tends to kill people over the age of 50 and almost no one under the age of 50, I mean, it still damages people, it scars their lungs, they end up in the hospital, it's horrible. Without medical care, they die if they're under 50, but they have a higher likelihood of surviving if they end up in the hospital. But saying that this primarily kills people over the age of 50, you would concentrate the death rates calculated in that 25% and basically multiply 3% or 4.5% or even 7.5% by a factor of 4 to estimate what this would look like within just people over the age of 50. And this will have extreme impacts on our culture in the future. And I don't think we can stop this, and I don't think we're going to be able to immunize against it anytime soon to make a, a measurable impact on this disease, because it we might get a slowdown in the summer, but I think it will come back and fall in full force. And um, we're just trying to buy time to prepare all of our infrastructure for all of this, the changes that are going to happen. And I think everybody is aware that this is happening and what it means and that, you know, it's, it's a serious thing. It's a time to reconnect with all of the people that are high risk because if they have a risk of, you know, one in four dying, then, um, yeah, it's going to change a lot of things. So the other issue is how we process these things emotionally. This is a shock to everyone and people respond to shocks like this in different ways. I personally find it easier to process the emotional aspect through art while remaining somehow separate from everything in real life. So I kind of close myself off to the emotional impact in the present. And I think about the emotional impact as something happening in a separate realm, an artistic realm in the past, in the future, something that is not where I am right now. And that keeps me free from pain. And I worry that that makes me weird, that if I'm not processing things in the present, that there's something wrong with me because I'm supposed to be. But I don't think that is true. I think it's okay to separate yourself because you have to be able to think clearly about everyone around you and maintain a positive attitude for your kids, just the semblance of normalcy, but while maintaining a connection to the knowledge that there is something very sad happening and that you just don't want to let that in too much. And you need it, but you have to let it in enough that you're aware of it, that you can process it. But you don't have to let it tear your heart out. So that's my theory of coronavirus coping, knitting, sunshine, making funny masks. I made one for my son that had was black with a skull and crossbones 
And yes, it is a brassiere, <laughs> but they're perfect. They really, they fit your face just exactly right. And I made one for my daughter with a cat nose and whiskers. Um, and that is what I would like to say about the coronavirus. I've written a lot about the details of how I notice small changes in my neighborhood and I see strange things and I struggle to put them in context because you know, you're never given the full story of what's going on in the world and we all are susceptible to speculating about what's really going on because I'm sure that there are people right now who are thinking that they're at war. There, there are always people who are fighting. And the rest of us aren't really part of that. We're just sort of like territory waiting to be claimed or protected. What else can you do? <laughs> um, I would love to hear your thoughts on how you're coping, and I encourage you to take a look at my novels. They are allow for processing of concepts that are hard to talk about directly, and I like that medium. I also encourage you to distract yourself with things like science and some of my science posts. They've proven very distracting for me, and I think that's a good way to spend time developing a knowledge base that you can pass on to your children, because that's what we're here for. We are here to keep the thread of civilization and knowledge, weaving it into the texture of life, keeping the torch burning, all of that. Okay, thank you.